country mouse. It was the summer of 1984 in Pasadena, and I stood on the sidewalk peering through a tiny slat in the wooden fence that was built to keep the Summer Olympic Stadium secret. <laughs> I thought, in my eight-year-old sense of grandiosity that had not yet been spoiled by preteen insecurity, they were building it just for us, for my family, to celebrate our moving there. How kind of them, how welcoming. Cities are awesome. My family had just moved to Pasadena from Reedley, a town best known for being next door to Fresno. <laughs> we lived in the LA area for five years, long enough to hit that awkward preteen stage that's filled with really big glasses, crimping irons, and scented roll-on lip gloss. And long enough for me to fall completely in love with the mall and all the shiny possibilities inside. My cousin, Lauren, lived nearby. She, my surrogate sister, just nine months younger than I. We awkwardly cleared the hurdle of junior high in SoCal together. She in braces and me in homemade culottes. There was a terrible moment in a store once when a boy whistled in our direction and we both turned to look. He did a very obvious once over of us in our glasses and puffy paint shirts <laughs> and said, Ew, not you! Which we internalized for decades. <laughs> to this day, I don't acknowledge catcalls for fear they're a setup for public humiliation. <laughs> Seventh grade ended, and then my family decided to move again because of God. No longer content to just be a church family, now we were to become a pastor's family. We were following God to the country this time, to a town named Waterford, population 1200, tucked in the armpit of Central Valley, California. My brother, three years my senior and wise to the effects of change, left kicking and screaming and demanding an electronic keyboard in exchange for the sacrifice he was making. <laughs> almost 13 and my mother turned to me and said, well, at least we'll have each other. And I thought to myself, oh God, this isn't going to work. I drove away from my cousin, waving to the enviable city mouse at her pegged pants while I became the sadder country mouse. Junior high and high school were spent in the small town of Waterford and life sucked for various reasons. Not the least of which was attending six different schools in five different years and never once getting kissed by anyone at any of them. I planned regular visits to the cousin and demanded to be taken to the mall when I was there. She became cooler and cooler, sporting the guest jeans I wanted so badly while I wore knockoff brands and pulled my shirt down over the insufficient label. She figured out what to do with her hair. It involved a lot of aquanet and blow drying. Well, I was and still am rocking the side ponytails. <laughs> and she got contacts years before I did. I equated all of her glamour with skyscrapers and freeways and the cultural cachet of a lot of people living somewhere. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, but I just knew it would be in a city. In the story, The City Mouse and the Country Mouse, one of Aesop's beloved fables, the city mouse is invited for supper at his cousin's, the country mouse's house, and he finds it entirely lacking in his superior gourmand foodie taste. In the city, where I live, the city cousin said, we dine on cheese and fish and bread, while you, country cousin, work your pals to the bone for humble crumbs in this humble home. They sit down to an enormous meal of local and sustainable food, <laughs> and just as they're about to take their first bite, a cat appears and they have to scuttle away. Then another intruder invades, and finally, the country mouse has had enough and eschews the big city for his simple supper. We had a childhood copy of Aesop's fables that my mother often read to us. I remember asking why Aesop felt he needed to write out a moral for each and every story. She said, it was for people who didn't read the Bible. They had to figure out how to live their life somehow, right? And this criticism caused me to read the stories with an air of distrust, because I distrusted all non-Bible reading Santa Claus believers. So while the moral of the story, as exclaimed by the country cousin, was, I'll take my humble crumbs in comfort over all your finery with fear, I saw the city mouse as the brave hero in the story, or at least the kind of hero I wanted to be. My country mouse inferiority complex raged on through high school, and with it, an enormously competitive surge of distaste for my cousin, who seemed to be living the life I wanted. 
One day, I told her, in regard to her appearance, you are perfect. She responded, almost. <laughs> she got to be a normal teenager, or at least normal in the way I wanted to be normal. The kind of normal that boys liked and looked a lot like that show Saved by the Bell. When I was 14, my mom was diagnosed with chronic progressive multiple sclerosis and went from cane to walker to wheelchair and was eventually unable to leave her bed. Someone told me it was because we didn't have enough faith and the phrase God's will was used so many times it lost all meaning. I blamed the small town with its crush of expectations and whispers and I think I still do a bit. I longed to be free of it all and was always hoping my fellow classmates would burst out into footloose dance moves, kick off our, <laughs> our Sunday shoes, embrace our inner Kevin Bacon so we could rebel in style against the small town faith. Never happened though. <sighs> so I fell back on the more traditional means of rebelling, like sneaking pink shibliss, which I pronounced shibliss because <laughs> I didn't know any better, um, and ditching. I ditched school to drive to the nearest town with a population of over 50,000. Modesto. <laughs> it, had, it had one really sad mall and a welcome gate that read water, wealth, contentment, health. And as far as I could tell, all of those were a lie. <laughs> I couldn't wait to grow up and move away. Fast forward to me living the dream in San Francisco. I love it here. I love the urine soaked streets of this city. <laughs> I love that you can get a beer float, a locally sourced carnitas burrito, and a fair trade single serve drip coffee all in one block. I love that almost anything passes for normal here, and that the mall is an architectural wonder, and it doubles as a university. <laughs> My cousin and I are great friends again, and we mutually champion awkward youth, and we will be choreographing a routine to Madonna's True Blue at her upcoming wedding. <laughs> I've been here for six years now, and I've been very happy, but I've discovered the danger of the city. It's not feline like in the fable. It's turnover. It's the risk and almost guaranteed inevitability that most of my friends will move away when it stops being a place they can live. Either because they want to own a house and they aren't an investment banker, or because they want to have kids and they think they need a backyard for that, or simply because they never planned on staying. Meanwhile, Everyone I ever knew in Waterford still lives there. So now that I've gained back some of my eight-year-old egocentricity and often think of San Francisco as the center of the universe, if I'm not careful, I can see that the country mouse had a point. And there is something comfortable about crumbs you can count on versus organic cocktails and the threat of change. Now, I think maybe a better moral for Aesop's fable would be Choose which mouse you know you must be in order to be you. To thine own mouse be true. <laughs>